This is the third video in a three-part series where I'm responding to one of the primary arguments a Jewish counter-missionary gave me for why he thinks Messianic Jews should leave Messianic Judaism. His argument goes like this. There are parallels between the account of Jesus and the stories of pagan gods. Therefore, Jesus did not exist. In the first video, I showed why this is just a terrible argument logically. Basically, by this logic, one would have to conclude that one of the most prominent rabbis in Jewish history, Rabbi Akiva, never existed because there are striking parallels between accounts of his life and Jesus' life. And if you want to see how I made that argument, be sure to check out that video. It's in the description below. In the second video, I went to the primary sources, showing why the parallels that this counter-missionary said existed between Jesus, Osiris, and Dionysus do not actually exist. Because this counter-missionary's argument came from a private conversation we had, I'm, whenever I need to refer back to this counter-missionary, I'll call him David. So now I'll give the final reason why I think David's argument is extremely weak. Even if David was actually right about the parallels between Jesus, Osiris, and Dionysus, or he found a different set of pagan gods that actually had parallels with Jesus, we have excellent reason to think that those parallels would be coincidental. Because the early Jesus movement was a sect within Judaism. It was born in a Jewish community. Our sources tell us that first century Jews hated paganism. And this means two things. It is unlikely that the founders of a Jewish movement would copy from pagan gods and it's also unlikely that Jews would choose to follow Jesus if he was a copy of pagan gods, essentially a pagan messiah. Before I show you why these points are in line with contemporary scholarship, I want to read a couple quotes from Jewish historians explaining how they use the book of Acts for historical research. So Dr. Pamela Eisenbaum says this, Acts constitutes an undeniable part of the historical record that can be mined for information about the origins of Christianity generally, as well as some of its central figures, like Paul, as long as it is used with awareness of its literary tendencies and particular bias. This is true of ancient and modern accounts of events. The late Dr. Geza Vermesh wrote this, Acts offers a genuine insight into the life, thought, and aspirations of the first generations of Jewish Christians. Both Dr. Eisenbaum and Dr. Vermesh are not Messianic or Christian scholars, and yet they see Acts as a valuable historical source for understanding the early Jesus movement. And I just wanted to highlight this before going into the text. Okay, so the first point is that the early Jesus movement was a sect within Judaism. And here are some reasons we know this. Among the various Jewish sects and groups during the first century was the early Jesus movement, who identified themselves as the Way. They did not consider themselves a new religion outside of Judaism. Acts 24 verse 14 records Paul saying to the Roman governor Felix and the Sanhedrin's lawyer Tertullus, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. Jewish scholar Dr. Daniel Boyarin rightly points out that the reason Paul says according to the way which they call a sect is because Paul views the way as, quote, the true way, while the Jews outside the early Jesus movement say it's just another school of Judaism. Also, what's important to highlight is that in Acts chapter 5, this describes the Sanhedrin flogging the apostles. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 24, Paul says, Five times from the Jewish leaders, I received 40 lashes minus one. And at first blush, you might be tempted to take this as evidence that the early Jesus movement was outside of Judaism. But rather, it demonstrates the exact opposite. The reason these Jewish believers in Jesus were liable to be disciplined by Jewish leaders is because the Jewish authorities viewed them as part of the Jewish community. Jewish scholar Dr. Claudia Setzer explains that this kind of punishment was intended to keep recalcitrant Jews in good standing in the community. Dr. Pamela Eisenbaum writes, The fact that Paul says he was subject to 40 lashes less one five times from synagogal authorities, 2 Corinthians 11.24, means that the synagogal authorities, as well as Paul himself, understood that he remained subject to Jewish authority. The book of Acts consistently describes the first Jewish believers in Jesus as Torah-observant Jews. They uphold circumcision, they worship in the temple, they offer sacrifices, they observe the Jewish festivals, including the weekly Sabbath, and they keep kosher. And if you want to see an excellent discussion that goes deeper into these issues, 
demonstrating that Acts is a Jewish text describing the early believers in Jesus as Torah observant Jews, read the book uh, Torah Praxis after 70 CE, reading Matthew and Luke Acts as Jewish texts by Dr. Isaac Oliver. I'll link his dissertation in the description below. So listen to what counter-missionary Rabbi Michael Skobak says about the early Jesus movement. The movement continued to worship in the temple and to bring sacrifices and to observe the rest of the Torah. Don't forget that. That's an important piece of the puzzle. The followers of Jesus, even after he died, continued following the Torah, continued worshiping in the temple, continued bringing sacrifices. Rabbi Skobek is right. Also, Jewish historian Dr. Gabriella Boccaccini, he simply says the Jesus movement was nothing more than a Jewish messianic movement. This is not just Dr. Boccaccini's view. The idea that the early Jesus movement was a sect within Judaism is something that both Jewish and Christian scholars of Second Temple Judaism agree with. As New Testament scholar Dr. James Charlesworth says, Today, Jewish and Christian experts of Second Temple Judaism recognize this movement as one aspect of early Judaism and acknowledge that what would become Christianity was for decades a sect within Judaism. This is key because our sources tell us that first century Jews hated paganism. And again, this means two things. It's unlikely that the founders of a Jewish movement would copy from pagan gods. And also, it is unlikely that Jews would choose to follow Jesus if he was just a copy of pagan gods, essentially a pagan messiah. So let's look at the ancient Jewish sources. In the Wisdom of Solomon, which was written sometime between 100 BCE and 50 CE, the Jewish author writes, for whether they kill children and their initiations or celebrate secret mysteries, the worship of idols not to be named is the beginning and cause and end of every evil. For their worshipers either rave in exaltation or prophesy lies or live unrighteously or readily commit perjury. For because they trust in lifeless idols, they swear wicked oaths and expect to suffer no harm. So that's from the Jewish perspective, okay? That's, this is a Jew just despising and hating paganism. So now let's see what a Roman perspective would be. The Roman historian Tacitus, writing between 106 and 107 CE, he says this about the Jews. They despise the gods and conceive of one God only, and that with the mind alone they regard as impious those who make from perishable materials representations of gods in man's image. That supreme and eternal being is to them incapable of representation and without end. So let's look at 1 Maccabees chapter 2, verse 19 through 27. Here is a Jewish author writing between 125 and 63 BCE, describing Mattathias' response to the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who commanded him and other Jews to participate in pagan worship. And this is what the text says. Mattathias answered and said in a loud voice, Even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him and have chosen to obey his commandments, every one of them abandoning their religion of their ancestors, I and my sons and my brothers will continue to live by the covenant of our ancestors. Far be it from us to desert the law and the ordinances. We will not obey the king's words by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. When he had finished speaking these words, a Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer a sacrifice on the altar in Modin, according to the king's command. When Mattathias saw it, he burned with zeal, and his heart was stirred. He gave vent to righteous anger. He ran and killed him on the altar. At that same time, he killed the king's officer who was forcing them to sacrifice, and he tore down the altar. Thus, he burned with zeal for the law just as Phineas did against Zimbri, son of Salu. Then Mattathias cried out in the town with a loud voice, saying, Let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. Then he and his sons fled to the hills and left all they had in the town. Paganism was not only hated, but this example shows us how zeal for the Torah led this Jewish leader, Mattathias, to kill for the sake of avoiding paganism. And interestingly enough, zealousness for the law is also how Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem are described in Acts 21 verse 22. And if you want to see an in-depth look at Acts 21, 
Watch our video, Did Paul Teach Against Torah in Acts 21, responding to Rabbi Michael Skoback. So go check out that video if you want more details on Acts chapter 21, an awesome, an awesome text to look at. Another example of showing that Jewish hatred of paganism, we see this in the first century Jewish historian Josephus recounting a situation when Pilate's troops brought Caesar's images into Jerusalem during the night. And this infuriated the Jewish people because the Torah forbids making such images. So in response, Josephus reports that multitudes of Jews traveled to Caesarea to plead with Pilate to take away the images, but Pilate refused. But the Jewish people there, they would not relent, and Pilate got so infuriated with them that he threatened to have them ex executed unless they left. And listen to what Josephus says. This is, how, this is how these Jewish people respond. But they threw themselves upon the ground and lay their necks bare and said they would take their death very willingly rather than the wisdom of their laws should be transgressed, upon which Pilate was deeply affected with the firm resolution to keep their laws inviolable, and presently commanded the images to be carried back from Jerusalem to Caesarea. So we see here that these Jewish people would rather be executed than have Caesar's images fill Jerusalem. Resisting paganism for first century Jews was deathly serious. In their book, The Jesus Legend, Dr. Paul Eddy and Dr. Gregory Boyd say this, With few exceptions, Rome respected Jewish religious sensitivities. Herod refused to build pagan temples or gymnasiums in Jewish areas, and refused to build an amphitheater in Jerusalem. And as we have seen in some religions heavily populated by Jews, special coins were printed without representation of the emperor in deference to the Jewish sensitivity to graven images. Such evidence hardly squares with the view that the Jews of the first century were syncretistic in their religious worldview. Because the early Jesus movement was a sect within Judaism, it stands to reason that they, like other Jewish groups, oppose pagan influence. And while the Jesus movement began as a community that contained exclusively Jewish members, even when Gentiles did join, paganism was despised by the leaders of the movement. This is most clear in Paul's writings, when he is writing primarily to non-Jews who are former idol worshipers. For example, Galatians 4 verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. In 1 Thessalonians 1 9, speaking about the Thessalonian Gentile believers in Jesus, Paul writes, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. It's highly significant. Paul calls the gods idols because it's the Greek word eidolon, which is a pejorative word used in Jewish and Christian texts to denigrate pagan gods. In fact, the late New Testament scholar, Dr. Larry Hurtado, points out that this word is not found in any pagan texts. Similarly, in Paul's writings, he also uses the term idolatry, the Greek word eidolalatria. Paul uses this word to negatively describe the worship of pagan idols, and like idolon, eidolalatria is not found in pagan literature. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14 and 20 through 21, Paul says this, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. No, I imply what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 10, Paul says this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There's no ambiguity here. Paul directly opposes the worship of pagan gods. In Acts chapter 15, during the Jerusalem Council, the apostles decide what commandments Gentiles are obligated to keep, and the following are included. To abstain from things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. It's not only that Gentiles must not engage in the worship of pagan gods, but they're also to abstain from eating food that has been offered to those idols, to those pagan gods. So to summarize my argument spanning three videos, let me give you the three reasons I, I covered. First, 
I found at least 10 parallels between Jesus and Rabbi Akiva, but that doesn't mean that Rabbi Akiva was just a copy of Jesus and never existed. So even if one shows there are parallels between Jesus and pagan gods, that's not enough to prove Jesus did not exist. So if you want to make that argument, you need to provide evidence for a causal connection. Second, the parallels don't exist. In the myth, Osiris' death is nothing like Jesus' death, and he actually doesn't rise from the dead. Also, Dionysus, contrary to what David told me, doesn't have 12 disciples. Even if David was actually right about the parallels, which he's not, but if he was right, it's highly unlikely that the founders of the early Jesus movement would copy from pagan gods because, like other first century Jews, they hated paganism. And it's also unlikely that Jews would join the movement if Jesus was a copy of pagan gods because that would essentially make him a pagan messiah. The idea that Jesus never existed but was copied from pagan myths may be popular on the internet, but it's laughed at by scholars. Because not only is the evidence for this lacking, but there's so much evidence against it. And I, I agree with those scholars. I think it's a terrible argument. If you learned something new, consider giving this video a like and be sure to subscribe for future videos and podcast episodes. If you'd like to add anything or disagree with anything I said, I would love to hear about it. You can comment below or you can email us at two messianic Jews at gmail.com. That's two T W O messianic Jews at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me and see you next time.